mirror. And under those circumstances, about 50 to 60 percent of people on the very first attempt will have an experience which they interpret to be a visitation from the dead. I Hello, this is Dr. Raymond Moody, and this is Your Superior Self. Man, perfect Sean. Raymond, thank you so much for joining the show. This truly is an honor for you for for me to have you on the show. Like this is it's so surreal for me because my journey kind of started out with life after life. And then huh. now here we are having a conversation on my podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, to the contrary, Trey. I mean, I'm just so delighted to this. And, uh, you know, I could tell from our interactions, getting to know each other, you're a really cool guy. And so <laughs> I'm just uh, honored to be with you uh, in this. Yeah, absolutely. Show. I think the most fascinating thing about your story is like, you know, one, I'm in psychology. I'm, I'm very much into psychology. You're very much, you know, obviously your background is psychology, but you also have a background in philosophy. So we have a like a, a very unique conversation whenever we speak because it's always about heavy, heavy material. It's always about philosophy. It's about the meaning of life. It's near death experience. So it's like I'm whenever we have a conversation, it's like I am just in these flow states of just like we just talked about earlier, creativity. But growing up, you what was your background? Was it atheist? I mean, you didn't really grow. I don't know if it was atheist, but like you didn't have like a strong religious background. No, uh, my dad was a surgeon. Number one, if you know that personality and number two, a professional military officer. And he was in the Pacific theater in world war two. Retrospectively, I've put it together that probably that uh, experience just turned him off on religion. And when I was a kid, he was kind of sarcastic about religion and, um, and, uh, and my grandmother, meanwhile, was kind of always making very humorous jokes about religion. And so to me, I just didn't grow up with any interest in that. It was astronomy that was my favorite subject. And uh, concurrently with that, Trey, it was, um, I was fascinated from very early age with uh, Lewis Carroll's books and Dr. Seuss, which I loved, mm -hmm. and um, the whole idea of nonsense. And an experience I had when I was about seven years old or eight really sort of set the tenor for the whole rest of my life. And that was uh, an experience you had, I'm sure, like as when I was looking through a telescope one night, I realized, holy mackerel, you know, what, si what size is this thing we're in, right? Mm -hmm. So your mind goes out to the wall, but then you say, just a minute, doesn't there have to be something on the other side of a wall? So you say, well, it can't just come to an end in a wall. But then the other option, only intuitively, is that it goes on forever. And that doesn't make any sense either. Mm -hmm. And so I remember that very night and I had this intuition or realization that that the world we live in is kind of bounded by nonsense. And yet that was okay for me because I was a fan of Dr. Seuss and, and Dr. Uh, and, and Lewis Carroll. So I've sort of carried those themes all the way through. I won't, wouldn't say that I was an atheist. It was more that I just didn't think about God. Mm. You know, I mean, if I had had to articulate my position back then, I was suppose it would have been that I just don't think it was possible to know whether there's a God or not. But sure. whatever, my focus was on astronomy. So I went to UVA at age 18 to study astronomy, but quickly got uh, taken into philosophy instead, declared a philosophy major as soon as I got there and took one course. And uh, what was it, Plato, right? I think. Yeah. Plato and in reading Plato's Republic was where I found out about these near death experiences. And at that time, um, I had up to then, I had always thought the idea of an afterlife was some, like a cartoonist thing, or that was my only exposure to it was no seriousness to it. But I remember specifically thinking, well, if this guy who's still my hero, by the way, 
thinks this question of an afterlife is serious and important, then I'm, I'm assuming it is. So <laughs> then about three years later, I actually met a living human being who had such an experience and uh, subsequently had the opportunity to interview thousands of people who came to the brink of death and had these experiences and um, just went on, got my PhD in philosophy. I was a philosophy professor for three years, then went to medical school and um, ultimately became a forensic psychiatrist working with um, mass murderers and paranoid schizophrenic killers and occasional serial killers mm. at a maximum security unit, which was, you know, just like a fulfillment of my childhood dream of traveling in space, I guess. <laughs> and um, so, but all through this, I've, I've continued to uh, be fascinated by these amazing stories of people who almost die in return. So, I mean, you almost died working in that uh, psychiatric ward, right? I mean, like you had a couple of experiences there that, uh, that were pretty uh, intense, right? With uh, some of your patients, like, well, yeah, but you know, that sort of goes with the territory. If you sign up to be a person working in a maximum security unit with psychotic killers, mm -hmm. <laughs> you oh. kind of expect you're going to get hurt. And, yeah. and I was, but, but, you know, that sort of came with the territory. It was just, um, what I finally left was thinking, well, you know, I'm being kind of selfish here. I got kids to think of. And, um, and so, but anyway, I continued it on a private basis for a while, but, um, mm -hmm. homicide is something that continues to just fascinate me. I, um, sure. talk to maybe as a minimum 300 people, probably more likely 400 or so. What fascinates, what is fascinating about that to, to you? I've spent a lot of thought, you know, getting that straight, Trey, and what I'm, why I, think that homicide is so fascinating, not just to me, but to lots of people look at the success of investigation discovery channel, right? Is that three things. Number one, to be honest, we've all had thoughts of killing somebody, right? Number two, it's dramatic, right? And number three, and this is the most fascinating part of it to me, is that every homicide is unique and yet every one of them conforms to one or more patterns. Mm. And that combination is just, I mean, it's in, fascinating. I remember sometimes we would review 15 cases a day on that unit. And I remember one specific day we were all sitting around. We had been through 15 cases that day of just these horrible things like you read about in the National Enquirer. And the social uh, expert, social worker expert on the um, ward on that, he sort of folded his papers together and he said, you know, you never get tired of this. Mm -hmm. And and you really don't. It's always, there's always something wow. um, new wow. and there's always something that goes by a pattern. Well, how, all right. So how do you go from there? So you leave, um, this type of work and you go and you start teaching again, right at university. And yeah. I think you're teaching philosophy at this point. And you, you meet an individual, you hear about his near death experience that leaves, that leaves a lasting impression on you. Yep. But something happened. You were, you were, you were teaching philosophy and maybe something came up, uh, Socrates or something like that. I don't know what it was, but a student came up to you and gave you a very graphic, story or graphic picture of his near-death experience like um, i wouldn't say graphic but a very articulated um, um translation of what his experience was is that what started your investigation with near-death experiences by the way you yeah. coined the term near-death yeah. experience um amazing stuff but was that was that student the one that sparked the initial <laughs> initial investigations well i think the initial spark was plato and and also Democritus, who was a, another philosopher about the same time. And they were both interested in these things. And they, Plato looked at it and took it seriously as an indicator of an afterlife. But Democritus, the atomist, said, well, you know, this is just the residual biological activity in the brain, a debate that we still have today. So I was fascinated by that. But it never occurred to me that it might be 
germane to the modern world. But uh, in 1965, I heard about through one of my professors, I heard about Dr. George Ritchie, who at that time was a psychiatry professor at University of Virginia, who had had this experience. And George, the best person I ever knew, actually, George <laughs> Ritchie. And he was very generous and open to talking to students. So I heard him talk. Then when I went to East Carolina University in 1969 to teach philosophy, just very soon afterward, um, and I was teaching Plato, and this, this young man came up after um, class, and he said, you know, we were, talk we were talking about Plato's dialogue, Phaedo, which is the, it's kind of the origin of Western thought about um, life after death. I don't know much about religion, but I do know from my reading that the Phaedo was the basis of the Christian theology of mm -hmm. the afterlife, for example. And so it had enormous influence. So I was really kind of talking more about the methodological aspects of this, this uh, dialogue. And so this very nice student, I remember today with his hair, kind of cut him on this bowl kind of thing. <laughs> and he came up and he said, Dr. Moody, I wish we could talk about life after death in this philosophy class. And he kind of accentuated the word philosophy. And I got his you know, his import immediately, which is that, hey, you know, I thought philosophy was about the big issues. And here we're talking about these logical things. And I said, well, why do you want to talk about that? And he said, because about a year ago, I was in a bad accident and my doctor said I died. <laughs> and he said, and I had an experience that has totally changed my life. But I haven't had anybody to talk about it with. So, of course, you know, invited him. And then, you know, I just, I heard the same thing from other students as, as I started talking about it to civic clubs, you know, which are always needing a speaker on Wednesday or Tuesday afternoon. And, and as soon as one invites you, they all invite you because they need constant speakers. And this, these were the movers and shakers in this little town. I mean, you know, that was back then, sadly, it was an all male institution sure. but you know these were the people who were in charge of everything and they would come up to me after this dr moody i've never told anybody this but and i heard same things from some of my colleagues on the faculty and uh, you know it very quickly became apparent that this was something that was um studyable probably because by that time see i mean the cardiopulmonary resuscitation was really coming in at that time. So there were just a lot more people who had been through this, who were, you know, who were really wanting to talk about it because, you know, sure. just most of the people I talked to in those earlier years had never told anybody except me about it. Yeah. Well, you came, I mean, you've studied so many of them. I mean, over a thousand cases easily, mm -hmm. uh, but you came up with like seven or eight, like characteristics of a near death experience. Like what are, do you remember what they were? Yeah. Um, if you look at thousands of cases or even hundreds of cases, what you see is that they have, it's like, there's about 15 common elements that crop up. Right. And one experience may have two or three or four of these things or six or seven or eight or some in extreme cases of really lengthy cardiac arrest may even have the entire 15. But how far they get into it seems to depend partly on how long they were out. Right. Mm -hmm. If you have a really long cardiac arrest, you're more likely to have the whole picture. Um, but the, the kinds of things that are most common is people say that uh, they hear the doctor say, oh, my God, he's dead or we've lost him or words to that effect. And a remark I've heard all around the world in so many words is, doctor, I have never been so alive as when I heard that doctor say I was dead. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they say it's like an intensification of consciousness, not, you know, a lot of people imagine dying is kind of like going to sleep where you're diminishing consciousness, but people say it's, it's, or going into a dream, but people say that, mo no, it's more like waking it up than it is going to sleep mm -hmm. and that consciousness becomes intensified. 
And they tell us that they get out of their body and they look down below, they can see their own physical body lying on the operating room table or whatever. And you can imagine the confusion at first, what's this all about? Um, but they're very quickly, they begin to get the eye. They can, they can see or not see in the visual sense, but there's a, there's a sense analogous to seeing. And, and, and when they, it's not that they hear the doctor or nurse talking. It's that they become aware of the thoughts of the doctor or nurse. Wow. So they're trying to put all this together. And eventually they come up to the idea that, oh, my God, this is what we call death. And at that point, people enter into states of consciousness, Trey, that no matter how smart they are or how many languages they speak or how well educated they are, everybody says the same thing. I just can't describe it to you. There are no words, right? So they enter into this experience that somehow lies beyond words. And in terms of the way they can't express it, they say that it, they become aware of a passageway of some sort, often compared to a tunnel. And they feel they go through this passageway, come out on the other side into this incredibly brilliant and warm and loving light. So like very comforting. And in that light, they say that relatives or friends of theirs are there to meet them as a sort of greeting committee, I guess. And they see them not in a physical body, but in this spiritual form that they find very difficult to describe. Mm -hmm. And most remarkably to me, I think this is the most interesting part of near-death experiences to me. They say it's kind of like time comes to a standstill. And all of a sudden, everything else kind of disappears. And they are surrounded by this holographic panorama which consists of every single thing they've ever done in their lives. And, and they say that when you see into this mirror chamber or whatever it is, that you can see yourself doing these, uh, these actions that you remember. But when the action has its consequence, the situation is turned around so that you are sensing it from the point of view of the person with whom you interacted. Hmm. So if you see yourself doing something mean to somebody, you feel that hurt as though it's yours. Sure. Or if you see yourself doing a kind-hearted action to someone, you feel the good feelings. Now, very often, this whole life review takes place in the accompaniment of a being of light, as this is just like a personal being that is not a form, but a sheer light of complete compassion. Christians tend to say Jesus or Christ, uh, Jews tend to say an angel or God, but whatever label they put on it, the description is saying this completely loving being who kind of guides them through this it, memories. And um, uh, it, they are impressed. People say that there is no judgment in this except what's coming for themselves. Mm -hmm. Because when you see all the things you've done and you're comparing it to this being who loves you completely, then naturally that you wish you would have done it that way. Right. Sure. So, so people come out of this, whatever they had been chasing in life, knowledge, I've chased knowledge all my life. Some people chase power or fame or money. I wish I'd chased money a little bit more now, <laughs> having two, two kids at home, but um, you know, it was knowledge was my thing. But whatever people were chasing before they say after this, that you realize that the most important thing that we can do while we're here is to learn to love. Sure. And so then at some point, obviously, people have to come back, the ones I've talked with. So they say some people say, I have no idea how I got back. I was in this light and then there was no no sense of transition. But I found myself back in my body. Sure. Or others say that somebody there told them, you got to go back. It's not your time to die yet. Mm -hmm. um, and yet others say that they're given a choice that they can either continue in the experience they were having or go back to the life they were leading. So obviously all the ones I've talked with chose to come back almost invariably because of somebody else. I mean, it's like because most like most commonly because they had kids left to raise. Right. So they come back on behalf of someone else. They find their lives are transformed in this way of realizing that the object of this thing we're in is to 
learn to love, and uh, also reassured that what we call death is a transition into another reality. So they say after this, there's no more fear of death. Mm. So you come up with all these char- similar characteristics in all these different individuals, right? Uh, what cracks me up, I don't know if it's in your book. I don't know if I read it in your book or not, but it was like, you know, science some scientists say, like you were saying, it's just some chemical that's released when in the brain when someone dies. But how can all these individuals, like I, I rarely have the same dream twice. How, yeah. and to think about other individuals having the similar experiences during a near death event is just, I don't know what the statistic, uh, statistics are, but it's like, it, it has to be outside of chance. I mean, it, it's just, yeah. That part, and and there is a real conceptual dilemma here. I mean, as to how you put this together, uh, Trey, is the real problem. The most of the debate that you hear about this is conducted on a very superficial level. I think partly because there's some people who are just too scared of this. You know, sure. I mean, they want things to to be like they already think they know, and in that kind of circumstance that going back to Plato versus Democritus, <laughs> it's really been the same thing. It's like Democritus said, oh, this is just the residual biological activity in the body. Today, it's oxygen deprivation to the brain, right? That, And what does that mean? Well, there's philosophical reasons for doubting that. I mean, in the real world, We just don't understand what the relationship between consciousness and the physical apparatus is. I mean, that's just unsolved. But more practically, it's a very common occurrence where the bystanders at the death of someone else, that as that person in the bed dies, the bystanders themselves have all of these things we call a near-death experience. People will tell me, as grandma died, I got out of my body. I started going up toward this light with her, and then I turned around and came back. Or people say the room fills with light or that, um, that they see relatives and friends who had died of the relatives and friends mm-hmm. of the dying person who had died coming into the room to, to whisk them away. And most incredibly to me, I've had a number of cases. I mean, I think this is not, you know, it's, it's, it's common enough that anybody who wants to look for this can find it, that people who are bystanders say that they empathically co-live the dying life review of the person who is really? passing away. Yeah. Now, to me, that's the most shocking thing I know about this, really, because, you know, when I try to imagine that myself, I mean, I'm trying to get myself accused, recused from my own life review, right? Much less the idea of having a spectator <laughs> there. And know, yet right? the striking thing about this is that when this happens to people, it seems completely natural, which mm. makes a certain amount of sense to me as a psychiatrist, because, you know, it's like people come with their deep, dark secrets and, you know, it may take them six weeks to get around to telling you the secret. But when you do, you know, you've heard that secret three times this week. You know, I mean, most of us have very similar secrets. right? Sure. Yeah, and so so it's really I mean, as startling as it appears that as it seems the People who experience this uh, co- empathically co-live the dying life review of their loved one really find it rather natural. For a long time, I assumed that this had to be, you had to be, have some personal connection with the individual to, to experience this. But several years ago, a physician contacted me and my wife and told us about um, he was called one day to the ER to resuscitate a patient he had never seen. So as he was trying unsuccessfully to resuscitate this guy, he said these images of the guy's life was, was all around him. So, you know, something really weird is going along here. And it's a collective uh, near-death experience. Hmm? It's like a collective near-death experience. A collective near-death experience. That's absolutely Didn't right. you have one with your, your mother, I think, in the book? I did. I did. It's the funniest thing. I was um, in the 93, 94, I was um, uh, 
going to devising a study for how to study these empathic death experiences. And incredibly, right about that same time, um, my mother uh, was passing away. And so um, my wife and I had this amazing sort of empathic experience with her as she was dying. And that's kind of thwarted my curiosity for a while. I backed away from it for a while because what drives me is curiosity, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking, well, I've experienced this. So it kind of settled my curiosity. Then as the years passed by, you know, I took it back up and I've written about this, um, you know, these empathic death experiences, as I call them, or shared death experiences. Sure. So you, you gather all these cases, you come up with the data, you write a book, Life After Life. Like how nervous were you like to release that book out into the world? I mean, you got, you're, you're, you have your career in front of you. I mean, I think you were in, were you, you were still, were you in graduate school when this book came out? I can't remember. No, I was just finishing up my uh, MD degree mm. and I had a PhD in philosophy already and I was finishing up my MD degree. And, you know, in a way I get looking back on that, I figure I probably should be more uh, trepidatious than I was, but, um, you know, it's, um, number one, I mean, this sounds sort of maybe not a nice thing to say, but it's just the way I am. Generally speaking, I don't care what other people think <laughs> as long as I, uh, I mean, you know, of course I do in the sense that when I do a piece of new work, I want to put it out to my colleagues to see their suggestions. And if they find a flaw, then I'm closer to truth because I've seen my mistake. But if they say, well, yeah, you're on the right track, that encourages you to go on with what you're doing. Right. So, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I am a social phobic. So once I got into this and they were calling me from New York to be on the today show or whatever, I mean, I was, I got, maybe you'd call it nervousness or whatever, but, but it never, I knew completely from my long experience that anybody who doubted this, if, especially if they were a doctor, could just look around among their own patients and quickly assure themselves that what I was saying was true, right? Because there were just so many of them by then. And um, I guess what I was not prepared for was the journalistic approach to things. I mean, I was a philosophy professor then. I, I taught a lot in medical school too, just taught medical humanities and such. So I was interested, I was sort of accustomed to the, the um, academic way of doing things, but what they wanted on the TV shows was off, often something sensational, you know, and I just, sure. now, but, but I always knew that it never worried me that I would be, um, uh, you know, the, the attack would be that, that it's not true because I knew that inherently it was such that anybody who investigated it seriously with an open mind would came, come to the same conclusions I did. Mm -hmm. So that was never a worry, but, um, you know, this, I was not, uh, the social part of it was stressful. Well, how did your life change after that book got published? Well, uh, you know, in a way, it's hard for me to put together what my wife, my life might have been like without that. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. I was into the near-death experience when I was 18 years old, right? So sure. I don't really have much of a impression of what I would have been like without that because I was so early that I uh, took to it. But um, well, did everybody start coming to you? Did like, everybody start coming to you because like I feel oh, yeah. like because I feel like a lot of people weren't talking about it back then. Like they didn't want to come out and That's say right. that they had a near-death experience because they didn't want to be looked upon as like an outcast, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, most of the people I talked to up, up until and shortly after the book was published had never told anybody before. The most common thing to say is, Dr. Moody, I've never told anybody this, but. <laughs> and so I knew it was very personal, but at the same time, I knew it was so widespread that 
the and but now one thing that really did come as a surprise, Trey, was that I was thinking that the audience for that book would be doctors and psychologists, right? Who would pick it up and say, oh, I, want, I don't know about this and would ask around among their patients and so on and would say, yeah, he's right. What I never anticipated was that the book was going to sell millions of copies. I mean, you know, it was published in November of 1975. And by January of 76, a few months later, I had a friend who's loved shortwave radio and he was listening to people talk about this book in europe in january after but and that's kind of freaked me out because i'm just basically a social phobic person mm -hmm. i mean i i love people but i'm at parties i'm the one who wants to go to the dark corner and hope hopes nobody will talk to me you know yeah so um and but that was it was not frightening in the sense that I knew that it would be confirmed. Um, I didn't realize it would be so quickly. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I was thinking more that the that nowadays, I mean, there's tons of research going on. I thought that that would happen off in the future, but that just a couple of decades after it was all, already a major research topic all over the world that that was surprising to me sure another part of this book that i love besides the near-death experiences is is the past life regressions and the oh man i mean you got so much so many good things in this book uh that i just recently read paranormal uh about what is the art of scrying yeah, i think that's what it is yeah like, what how did you explain what scrying is or explain yeah. your experiment and then how did you come about with that well trey i mean you know all my friends all is know me well i'll say i'm such a bore right <laughs> which i really am because as incredible as all this stuff may seem it really just goes back to one root interest to me and that is the amazing story of ancient greek philosophy i mean if you took the events that took place from 600 bce um just at the dawn of philosophy to the 280 years later with the death of aristotle and you wrote it up as a article and you tried to get it published in the national Enquirer, they would reject it because nobody would believe it i mean it's just too sensational and that is that a big part of the um whole western way of thinking came from speculation and theories about these near-death experiences on the one hand and another element of it was that the greek the Greeks had these institutions called oracles of the dead, where the story is not like mediumship, but you would go to these places and they had techniques during which you would seem to see and converse with the spirits of departed relatives. And I remember the day I read that, it was re I was reading in, um, it, well, first of all, it's in several of the Greek dramas like Aristophanes, the comic playwright, makes fun of the oracles of the dead. Just like, you know, there'd be people today, the same thing. Sure. But then, uh, like Herodotus, the historian, was writing about him. And yeah, I remember reading this thing about his Herodotus saying, yeah, that this, this King Periander sent a delegation to the oracle of the dead to call up his deceased wife, Melissa. And I remember thinking I was a big, a big fan of Herodotus already by that point, but I thought, you know, he must have had a bad day there because in my 18 year old omniscience, I knew full well that there couldn't be a place where you could go to call up the dead. But it's true or not, it was a major input into the history of how people got thinking about things. A lot of these early philosophers were specifically identified by the public as participants in these things at the Oracle of the Dead. So that's where it was until um, about 1986, I guess. I was reading an article in a classical journal, and it was about how the, they had rediscovered the most famous of the Oracles of the Dead. The, it's directly below Albania in the Greek pro, um, province of Thespertia, direct and... Um, that they had gone there and just dug where 
Herodotus and Odyssey, I mean, uh, the Homer and a lot of sources said it was, but nobody had ever looked because it couldn't be, right? So they, mm -hmm. they dug up this place and based on what the archaeology report said, I re immediately realized, number one, what they were doing, and number two, realized that incredibly it would work. And that was what they found was this enormous bronze cauldron down under the ground in this chamber. And there were carbon marks on the walls to show that they used illuminated by torchlight. And the people who were seeing the dead were apparently encircling this cauldron and looking down into the cauldron. And so the archaeologists said, well, this is fraud. You know, they had those people down there 29 days. And so by then they could figure out what the person they came to see was like. And they would hide in the cauldron and act out the role. I thought just a minute here. These people were the founders of rationality that they would be fooled by something like that for over a thousand years. Didn't seem probable to me, but more, more importantly, I knew that there is a, there is a in from psychiatry that there is a uh, process when you can get people to gaze into what's called an optical clear depth, a mirror with with a, in a darkened room, or um, in the Middle East still today they they take a silver bowl they'll highly polish it on the inside, fill it up with olive oil, then dark darken the room and have by candlelight. If you look into that, you see these eidetic images, not like mental images, which are kind of vague, but they're actually projected into the visual space. They're 3D, colored. They take on a life of their own. So putting that together, I just said, well, this is what it is, and set it up, and it just, it worked. And um, so uh, a lot of people now have practiced this as a um, grief therapy technique. It was in the medieval period, it was a standard Greek um, as a standard Greek therapy, grief therapy thing that doctors knew about. They would set up a mirror and they could get their grieving patient to gaze into the mirror and go through a process. And then you'd see these, these sure. apparitions. But I mean, you set up an experiment at one of your universities where you had a, you actually went to like Alabama and bought a house and you set up this, this, this room where you painted the walls black and you had a mirror yeah. up, you had a seat, you had a candle, and That's I think right. you had like, I don't know how many um, uh, people that you had experiment, but it was like, well, one I've got it. Like one of four of had an experience. It. Like that's, I mean, that's 25%, right? Like, I mean, uh, that's, well, it was about uh, the, you, I finally got it up to the point about 50% of the people on the first attempt will have an experience. However, if you first of all ascertain that they can see mirror visions just without having an agenda and, showing them this and then if they see something then then you can add the preparation process which is basically you ask the person to choose some one person they want to see again who had died and then you take them through a process kind of like grief therapy right like like what was this person like and you just open-ended questions to get people to talk and reminisce and take them through a process in an hour or two then you put them into this room and you tell them just to gaze away into the um, mirror. And under those circumstances, about 50 to 60 percent of people on the very first attempt will have an experience which they interpret to be a visitation from the dead. I, that came as a real surprise to me. I understood that a certain percentage of people would see visions, right? But, but especially since my, co my colleagues and my graduate students of psychology were my subjects, people who already knew about the mind, and I thought, well, if they see anything, they'll say something like, oh, yeah, I saw this image. It looked like my grandma, but was it real or was it a figment? I don't know. That was what I confidently expected. Imagine my surprise when the very first person there is this very seasoned um, alcohol and, and drug rehab counselor, which, as you may know, that's a very, very earthy group of folks. She was 44 years old, a very wise and well put together person, came out of there saying not that, you know, I, you know, saying that she saw her her father and talked to him and all. And so uh, that was a real surprise to me, but that's how it's panned out that 
people don't take this to be a dreamlike experience. They, they interpret it to be a real encounter. An actual event. Like you had one, like you had an experience with this. Like I, I did. Your grandmother came and like, you, I came, did. Out of the, you came out of the, 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 the room and you sat down and all of a sudden you look up and there she is like, I would have yeah. crapped my pants. Like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Well, you know, you wouldn't because it's the, I, that's what you would think. I mean, which I would have thought, but yeah. by then I would guided through many, so many people through it. My attitude was, well, if this happened to me, I would understand it's just a figment. Right. But, but um, no, I mean, I, I mean, I just, to this day, I'm speechless about it in a way, Trey. Cause I mean, I, I just, I have to tell you that, I mean, I, from my, the experience I saw and communicated with my deceased grandmother. I felt her presence. I, I mean, it's just really startling. I, um, one thing that my wife, I think, has a really tough time with me about this is that, I mean, and I don't want to sound cantankerous at all, but to me, logic is a very precious thing. It's not the be-all and end-all, but I figure if you're going to reason about something, then the most fun is to reason about it rigorously. <laughs> I've never understood the kind of person who, when they use reasoning, what they, they settle on what they already think or they want to be, and then they put together some sort of, no matter how flimsy bridge of reasoning to get there that can't be any fun because if you're deceiving yourself by definition you understand you are well whereas if you really go by the re rules of reason and practice assiduously and try as hard as you can to to refute something rather than to confirm it see is the what makes it fun and if it survives that process, you can get have a certain amount of confidence that you're on the right track, right? Always with the understanding that you might be mistaken. But, um, you know, one of the biggest tragedies in this whole field of inquiry, um, Trey, is that, you know, the people who characterize themselves as skeptics about this kind of thing. And I'm, I hate to sound harsh, but hey, I've got a certain license. I'm 76. Those people don't know what they're talking about <laughs> because, and I'll tell you why. The skeptical movement happened to have here. This is one of the ancient manuals of skepticism that this is, is by skept, uh, Sextus Empiricus. But the skeptical movement came about after Aristotle codified logic, right? And if you think about what logic is, it's a system for generating conclusions, right, from premises. So Aristotle made this an enormous contribution to thought about 20, 30 years later. Pyrrho, P-Y-R-R-H-O, who, who understood logic very well, but he got to thinking just a minute here. What if we, we, knowing logic is what we do, we really apply it assiduously. We bear down on every question. We really reasoning it out. But instead of drawing a conclusion, we withhold the conclusion. What would happen? And that's what a skeptic is. Okay. Now, the reason they do this is not sheer orneriness, but rather because they found that if they did this as a spiritual practice, like constantly refraining from drawing a conclusion that two things would happen. Number one, their minds would expand. And number two, if you think about it geometrically and everybody else is running in this direction to get to the conclusion, but your technique is to withhold a conclusion, then you see side pathways of inquiry that everybody else missed because they're focusing in this sure. direction, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what a skeptic is. Now, Run in your mind what the so-called skeptics tell us. Oh, I'm a skeptic about these near-death experiences. I think it's just the chemistry of the brain. Well, if you unpack what they just said, it is, oh, I'm a person who doesn't draw conclusions, and my conclusion is such and such, yeah, right? So it's, a yeah, self-contradiction. Yeah. 
So it's it's like sadly the the whole movement to try to investigate these things. They don't even know what skepticism is. The organized skeptics actually are members of the humanist movement. I won't get into what that is, but it's um uh you know it's not anything to do with skepticism sure. and. So what we really need is good skeptical thinking. So because I am, that's my natural tendency. It, I just really fought this tooth and nail. I mean, I just, first of all, it's still very counterintuitive to me that the idea that there's an afterlife. And I just, all these years, I knew that these people were sincere. That was plain. And I knew that they were telling me what they really experienced and I knew it wasn't oxygen deprivation to the brain. But what it was, I just didn't know. I mean, you, just because you can prove it's not oxygen deprivation to the brain, it doesn't follow that it is life after death. But where I've come in all honesty is that a few years ago, I just gave up. I mean, I, I haven't drawn a logical conclusion. But where I got was I just I ran out of... Uh, yeah. I, what else to say? I mean, I just, you know, I know so many medical doctors, for example, whose medical judgment I completely would trust if heaven forbid I had to see a doctor. But on the other hand, they unanimously all from their near death experiences tell me, yeah, you know, I, it was real. I had this experience as I was real. That's impressive to me. And then also the fact that it's so common is, I mean, I got a lot of cases of, medical doctors who empathically co-lived to the dying experiences of their patients. And so I realized something just impossible was going on. And I just, and I, it's, it's still really I, almost speechless. And I stutter sure. when I say it, but. Well, it's like you, you, you have this belief of this, that you have this belief, you have this da data that supports this theory that there is life after death. However, like your famous quote in your book, I've gotten you to the pearly gates. However, I haven't gotten you past them. Like, I don't know because you haven't spoken to an actual dead person. You've spoken yeah, to people that right. have come back. So it's like, you can't really, you can't really support life after life after death because the data doesn't show that it just shows people coming back from that point and telling right. their stories. You want to go from belief to known. That's where I'm at, yeah. right? I want to. I don't yeah. want to believe it. I don't want to believe their stories. I want to know that they're. It's true. It's accurate. My question yeah. for you is: You being 76, do you fear death? No, I don't fear death, but life scares me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I don't want any pain in the process, right? I mean, i I've, I've had a kidney stone, a gallstone. I, I'm hope I'm finished with that. But the pain, I, I don't like that idea. And I got a 20-year-old and a 22-year-old at home. I, I mean, you know, I'm, I, they're dependent on me. To I would like, I mean, sure. ideally, I'd like to stay around for a while for them. But sure. I also don't want to get into the downhill spiral, like the mm -hmm. fall and then the visit to the old folks' home. I'm sure. sorry. I mean, I just want to get out of here painlessly, peacefully, and pleasantly. Mm -hmm. And with all, with my obligations taken care of as much as I can. Sure. What are you working on now? I know you've got a, a new book coming out, um, which I'm pretty yeah. excited about. Is it out now? Yeah, I have two books that I've uh, published in the last year. Um, well, and we talked uh, about, we talked about changing the paradigm. And yeah. You, you, the, what is it? Making sense of nonsense is one of them. That's right. That's right. Making sense of nonsense. Basically, what this is is that um, I have figured out a way to think uh, logically about things that don't make sense. As paradoxical as that may seem, it really works. And um, so, basically, this is my life's work. It was part of my doctoral dissertation in 1969. So I've spent my life on this, and then. This work and where it teaches the mind how to think about things that don't make sense. Well, as I've already seen, it's happened at least once that I know about. When people 
or accommodate their minds to this new way of thinking, then the clock starts. Eventually, some of them are going to have near-death experiences, right? Mm -hmm. And what I conjecture, I sort of lay this out in the book as to why, but it, it works out. You can see it once you think through it. That somebody who was in that situation, who knew how to think about things that don't make sense going into the near-death experience, would come back with the ineffability problem essentially greatly alleviated. That is, instead of saying, well, I had this experience, but I don't know how to talk to you about it. They would say, hey, I got this new, and, and it does work that it's just uh, about several years ago, a very eminent um, artist and um, scientist who had been to one of my workshops several years later had a near-death experience. And he's telling me that, Oh, when he was all over on the other side, he said, Raymond, my mind went back to the seminar I had. And he said, I saw that what you're saying is true, that you can't comprehend how that world is connected to this world unless you take the unintelligibility axis into account, which is, I guess, the way a physicist would say it. But um, basically, I've worked out this sort of program. It consists of text plus um, exercises that you go through it and it actually reformats your mind to think not just about life after death, but uh, attorneys have told me that it improves their critical thinking skill. A lot of people in advertising say that I just swear by this book. They say it really helped me in my work. Uh, medical doctors have said, Oh my God, I say so much about my patients. I mean, it's kind of a, sure. it's, um, it's, you know, it's Dr. Seuss's books. <laughs> have sold over 600 million copies. Now, what that means, together with all the, you're a little young to remember about doo-wop music, like which is a combination of nonsense as the main line, together with meaningful parts like shana na 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 shana na 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 get a job, or, or nursery rhymes or playground rhymes, like one bright day in the middle of the night, two dead boys got up to fight back to back. They faced each other, drew their swords and shot each other. A blind man came to see the fray. A dumb man came to shout hooray. A deaf policeman heard the noise and came and killed those two dead boys. That's the playground rhyme that many, many people have fond memories of. Or, or if you like jazz, um, Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong scat singing, which is... Um, nonsense syllables just more spot improvised that that really do you know they lift your mind to elsewhere so there's a lot of um de penetration of nonsense into into song and poetry and um uh, also into religion like with the and the christian tradition the glossolalia which is nonsense syllables put together without order in a way that really does bring about an ecstatic state or in the Zen Buddhism, the koans, what is the sound of one hand clapping? So nonsense has always had a very, you know, spiritual uses as well, but because people don't like the word nonsense, then they sort of shut that out. And because of that, bifurcation that on the one hand, we love nonsense, but on the other hand, we don't like the word. That really closes out uh, rational thought about a whole range of things, one of them being the question of life after death. Mm -hmm. But if you correct that deficit, then it opens up entirely new ways to investigate the question of life after death. I love it. I love every bit of that. So your newest book is God is, God is Bigger Than the Bible. That's right. Um, and people can find that yeah, from at Amazon. Life After Life or Amazon. Lifeafterlife.com is your website, and they can go to Amazon, and they can buy God is Bigger Than the Bible. What yeah. is that about? Well, you know, I'm really happy with this book because it's um, basically, I not being from a religious background, my encounter with God has turned out, I mean, that's just um, what I find Trey, is that I've seen a lot of people who are looking for God, but they're kind of turned off by religion and they don't know anything about the Bible, so they get intimidated. And so what this book is all about is what I've learned about God from the thousands of people I've talked with who had near-death experiences, who have experienced the presence of God during their experiences, and my own personal encounters and sort of 
putting this together in a whole new way of um, thinking about God, not in terms of abstractions like does God exist, but rather in terms of relationship. Like, really, I mean, um, Mm. if somebody asks me, Raymond, do you believe that God exists? I say paradoxically, no, no, absolutely not. Because, number one, any belief that I, Raymond Moody, can formulate about God being a limited person is bound to be skewed in one direction or another, right? And also, if you think of that sentence, do you believe that God exists, the emphasis of the of the sentences on the word exist. Well, as a professor of logic, I could sit here and take about an hour, but I could show you what it means to say that something exists, mm-hmm. right? It's a frame setter more than anything else. It like tells you how to think about other things. Well, doesn't it put a boundary on, doesn't it put God in a box when you do that? Exactly. See, I think that all these people are, does God exist? They're worrying whether God exists. I say, that God is greater than existence. Existence is a human concept we use for very specific reasons. And God doesn't fit into that box. What I say is I have a relationship with God. And if you ha- engage in a relationship with God and you pray and all things happen. So that's, that's what this book is about. Raymond, I wish I could like just freeze time right now and we could just talk about this stuff all night long because like this yeah. is seriously like one of the best things, but one of the best conversations ever. Um, Thank you. So people need to go to lifeafterlife.com. They can go to Amazon, buy your books. Um, last question, kind of, you know, I'm really interested in this, um, especially your answer. What do you want your legacy to be? That I was a good father. Yeah, it's, um, you know, Trey, the interesting thing is when you're a, a kid, you hear about this, the most, the happiest life is a life of serving others, right? You hear that when you're a kid as an ideal. As life goes on, it becomes an aspiration. When you get to my age, it's just a fact of experience. You know, and that is you just learn empirically that as long as you're focusing on yourself and your ego, you're always miserable. And it's that liberating thing where you can wait out and just be focused on helping other people. That's when life gets interesting. I love that. And uh, in terms of my intellectual legacy, though, I mean, I'm, I'm happy about my work on near-death experiences, but I think in the long run, what I'm going to be remembered as intellectually is the guy who figured out a whole new code of logic, how you can think about things that are unintelligible and how it opens up whole new areas of inquiry, not just in life after death, but a whole lot of other practical applications of it too. And plus that it's fun. Yeah, I love yeah. it. We got to have you back on, man. Um, yeah, yeah, this, this is, is fun. Great. Raymond Moody, Doctor Raymond Moody, thank you so much for joining the show. This seriously is uh, an amazing, an amazing conversation. Thank you so much. This was just so much fun, man. And I'm just really thank you, thank you, thank you for this, and also thank you so much for all the people listening in too. I just really appreciate you spend this time with us. Mm-hmm.